Yay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, cool. Let's get started then. Okay. Um, we'll see. Usually, I would love to be able to stop at after 30 minutes. Okay. But some went even up to one hour and 10 minutes. So it depends. It really depends on, on the conversation. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> cool. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode, another interview with a successful and inspiring entrepreneur. I'm Mihai Herman and I help creative entrepreneurs build successful businesses and leverage the, the, the power of authenticity to build successful businesses, drive more sales and eventually be happier. Thanks. Today's guest is Cynthia Lewis. She's the creator, creator and host of Redefining Revolution podcast, which you can find on iTunes. And Cynthia is, the, is in the business of learning from powerful and empowering women. Her company, Redefining Revolutions, is all about interviewing and coaching women around the world who are changing the game in their communities, in their careers, and on a global level. Women who are literally, literally redefining what it means to have a revolution. Thanks a lot for accepting my, my invitation. Thanks a lot for being here. And as always, my very first question is about you, your story, and why did you decide to become an entrepreneur? Um, that's a great question, because I often start with the very same question. Um, so thank you so much, um, Mihai, for having me um, on your podcast. I love what you do. Um, I'm grateful and humbled to be here. Yes. Uh, um, so... I started, oddly enough, on a very traditional trajectory. Um, I actually was really, I paved a path so that I would be going to law school. All, all roads for me led to law school. And that was what I had been taught at a very young age. That's what I went to, like when I was in college, everything was all about eventually going to law school. Um, you know, looking back, the reason why I wanted to go to law school was so that I could end up building clinics um, for survivors of sexual violence, legal clinics for survivors of sexual violence. So that was what my work a lot of a lot of my work really centered around um, re empowering and healing women um, who were survivors of sexual violence, because I myself am a survivor of sexual violence. And so that was really my work for a long time. Um, and then I get to law school and I absolutely hate it. Um, I was literally nearly almost failing my classes. I mean, that's how bad it was. I went from a 4.0 to nearly failing my classes in law school because I hated it that much. And in that moment, I realized, holy crap, I made a mistake. You know, I mean, I made a hundred thousand dollar mistake. And it was, um, it was painful. It was one of those moments where I had really lost a lot of my identity. Um, I had to make a decision to leave law school. And that was probably one of the hardest decisions, but also one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, because I was, for once, I was deciding for myself what I wanted. And I was not, you know, going after something that someone had dictated for me, right? classmates and family and friends were all saying, yeah, be a lawyer, be a lawyer, be a lawyer, right? Doctor, lawyer, accountant, pick one. And um, quitting law school was a major identity crisis as well. I think that a lot of people listening right now, people who go into entrepreneurship, it, normally it isn't just a smooth sailing in, right? Like it isn't a doc that says, oh, there's entrepreneurship, land ho. It usually you're crashing into you know, an island called entrepreneurship and you're like, oh, fuck, I hope this is, I hope this works out. You know, I hope there's food, water, something, yeah. you know, where I can survive. But that's really what it was. It was an identity crisis. Um, and I went for a long time dabbling in, you know, network marketing and MLMs and sort of building my own consulting company that crashed and burned. And, you know, it was entrepreneurship is not romantic. <laughs> um, I think that you know that. And it's I, not a straight line, it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long time um, to get to the place that I am, and I'm still growing, trust me. Um, but I came into entrepreneurship um, a couple of years ago when I, you know, uh, 
my husband kept saying, why don't you just do what you love? Why don't you serve women? And I always thought that was the stupidest thing in the world. Who's going to make money doing that? I said, that's stupid. Doing what you love. Ugh, so great. Yeah. What a, what a dream. I, I said to him and uh, lo and behold, he was right. <laughs> and I think a lot of a lot of people have said the same thing. And so today, what I do today is really a dream come true. I get to um, serve and really learn from and collaborate with um, empowering women, women that are doing just incredible things all over the world. And I feel um, blessed to um, find myself um, in the position that's most authentic to myself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I bet you had, I mean, every beginning is scary. Yes. I bet you had a lot of fears and doubts when you, when you started on, on this path, especially as you talked about uh, your identity crisis. Can you share some of that with us? Um, here's, here's my first secret I'll reveal to you. Um, Mihai. I still have fears. We all do. Um, I think that there's this myth that somehow you become a master and you just get to sit at the very top of this mountain and you don't have to work anymore and all your fears are gone and you're just this master. The reality of it is mastery is continuously trained. Mm -hmm. Training never stops. Tony Robbins says that, right? Training never stops. Um, and so I think the fears are there. Fears are healthy. I think um, you learn to better respond to them as you get um, as you get wiser as an entrepreneur, there's less reaction and more response. Response mm -hmm. comes from a place of wisdom. Reaction comes from a place of ego and fear. Um, and so you just become a better responder. Um, but I think my fears were, were then, and some of them still are very much the same as most entrepreneurs or people just being creators, be, you know, people who have careers and entrepreneurs. Everybody has similar fears, but I think mine was like, I'm not good enough, you know, <clears throat> why, why would anybody, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, Brene, Brene Brown talks about the two voices, right? Um, I'm not good enough or um, who do I think I am? Oh, I had those voices tackling each other on a daily basis and they still come up sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that was a big one for me. Um, why would anybody pay, pay me, um, let alone someone who is, um, you know, I never, I, I would, I refuse to call myself an expert. And I think that was a major roadblock too, right? I, I didn't read all the books. Mihai. I, haven't, I haven't studied every seminar. How do I know that I'm an, I'm not an expert. So-and-so is an, I would call everybody an expert except for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so those were the roadblocks that most entrepreneurs, most creators have. They're all mindset. Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost, I can almost guarantee you, it's always a mindset issue. Um, and those, that, that stuff that gets taken care of on a daily basis, mental hygiene and yeah. mental health and mindset rejuvenation is a full-time job. It's every single day. You don't just wake up one day and you're like, Oh, I don't have to clean the house up here anymore. Every day. I do it every single day. I love the idea, mental hygiene. I never yeah. heard this, but it sounds sounds super interesting. Thanks a lot for bringing that bringing that up because uh, the thing about you don't actually overcome your fears, but you kind of learn how to deal with them better and better. Because at one point, um, I read some books and they kind of gave me the impression that if I worked enough on myself. I will no longer have to deal with any fears. Mm -hmm. And every time I had fears, I started to feel like, shit, there's something wrong with me again. Yes. And yes. that drove my self-love down, mm -hmm. down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I, right now, as I'm learning that that's not the case, that's not how life works, mm -hmm. I love to, to teach that uh, more often or as, as mm -hmm. often as I can. Awesome. Um, can you share any book or any mentor or event that played a super important role in your in your growth, especially on on the mindset part of things? Yeah, um, 
I will always recommend, and I always gift this book. Um, it's Mindset by Carol Dweck. And I have read that book, oh my gosh, at least a dozen times. Wow. And, and I still go back to it. I still go back to it. Um, it is, I mean, it's, I think that book is imperative. I think every single human being should read it. Um, there's something really profound about really thinking about and acting on the spectrum of mindset, of, of, of your mindset. And she talks about the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. But mm -hmm. she also talks about how we're not always one or the other. Um, you know, when you pick up the book and you start reading it, you start realizing, oh, I know all the times I was, I was in a fixed mindset. I can tell you all the times, but that takes self-awareness, right? I think to have the mindset that we want you know, as entrepreneurs and as just human beings, right? Living a fulfilling, enriching life, we have to be self-aware and sometimes being self-aware is it it can be painful it's not fun it, all the time <laughs> no, uh, no, no it's not and you know um gary vaynerchuk talks about this and and i and i absolutely love him he he is a big mentor you know of mine mm -hmm. um, a remote mentor obviously like for anybody else who's listening to him um, but he talks about that so adamantly um mind or excuse me self-awareness being self-aware means really removing the ego um, at every step along the way. Um, and so that would, that's someone for sure. Mindset, the book Mindset. Um, Mindset by the Carol. First, Carol and what's what's that? her last name? Carol. Dweck. It's, it's Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Cool. And... Um, I remember when I very first started out, like back in law school, I was reading Tim Ferriss, mm -hmm. The Four Hour Work Week. Um, the 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 title is, I mean, the title is funny, right? At best, uh, but what's important about that book is the incredible amount of resources that Tim Ferriss provides um, in that book. Um, Brene Brown mm -hmm. and Brene Brown, anything and everything Brene Brown has is producing right now, I think is is absolutely pivotal. Um, to any, not just any entrepreneur, I would say, but really anyone seeking, um, seeking a life that is true, of their truest truth. Exactly. Um, as, as a friend of mine says, the truest truth. Um, Brene Brown, absolutely. And, um, Deepak Chopra's Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That book, um, I, is another book that I regularly get. Oops. Okay. Sorry. I left for a moment. I'm here. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I love Brene Brown and she kind of changed my life and exposed really? me to this authenticity and vulnerability and, and all that stuff. And uh, I totally recommend uh, to everyone Brene Brown. Agreed. <laughs> and I found another, I'm, I'm not sure about you, but I'm, I love to say recovering perfectionist. So <laughs> <laughs> I still get go there a lot of the times, but yeah. I'm more aware, as you said, about about going to those places. Yeah. And I found a book recently by Tal Ben Shahar, The Pursuit okay. of Perfect. And oh. it's literally amazing. I mean, I read every day like two pages and I have yeah. four aha moments. Yeah, it's really that good. At least, at least for me, because I can, I can, f I can see myself in a lot of in a lot of those yeah. states. And he talks about the difference between being a perfectionist and an mm -hmm. optimalist. So that's super, super powerful. <clears throat> can you can you tell me a little bit more, like the uh, between the two, what uh, you've learned so far? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's it's hard to explain because. There's so much I've learned, yeah. but I'm still apply. I'm still integrating that into mm. into my life. You the are thing is that, yeah. The thing is that <laughs> perfectionists are so afraid of failing that they don't even try. I mean, and they have this all or nothing approach. I mean, mm. it cannot be. They don't have gray lines. It's mm. either black or white, and they go mm. to these extremes. And because of that, they are super super afraid of of failing. That's yeah. why they don't, they procrastinate, 
they don't try new things and all that stuff. On the other hand, optimalists are understand that part of life is to fail. And mm -hmm. in those so-called failures, you learn the most. And failure is part of is part of the growth. And yeah. a super interesting thing is that perfectionist perfectionists see life as a straight line. Mm -hmm. while optimalists understand that life is not a straight line so you have these mm -hmm. ups and downs mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. that was super super powerful for me and i was like oh my god how could i think like that <laughs> but i i yeah it's not it was a pattern and i didn't consciously think in a certain way i was just reacting and right. and right now i'm i'm learning how to respond to certain circumstances uh in 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 a much different way and i can truly Absolutely. say that i've been working with with a coach on this perfectionist uh, perfectionism mm -hmm. but with every day that passes by with every book that i'm reading with every video that i watch i feel like i'm learning better and better how to how to deal with that I don't know. Do you call do you, do you call yourself a perfectionist? Or um, you know, I don't know that it was. It was. I think it was more towards fear of failing and and a little bit, you know. But I think that that all really fell away when I when I failed out of law school. You know, I mean that was that was such an epic fail. I, I mean, I can't. <laughs> And it was it was so amazing. I mean, I can look back now and I savor all of my failures. I mean, it's almost like I can't wait for my next one because I'm so excited about what I can learn. Like I know that every year at the end of the year, um, you know, people celebrate New Year's in all different ways, and I celebrate it by literally going back the entire year and discussing all the things that I failed on. Oh my god! And, it, and I love it. <laughs> and I love it. It brings wow. me joy because. I can look back and really think about what came of those failures because I really use them as tools for the next day. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, but, you know, but don't get me wrong. There are days where I fail and I mean, and Brene talks about that, right? Brene Brown talks about that in the moment. I'm not, ah, uh, in the moment I'm like, Oh my fuck this. Like, I can't do this. This is horrible. What's going on. And, you know, it's sort of a downward spiral, but, I think that the difference between someone who will ultimately be successful and push through is that person who's changed their mindset when they look back on their failures. Those who, those who look back on their failures and are continuously reliving the past in a lot of agony and mistrust and dragging it along everywhere they go, um, that's where you, you're stunting your growth. That's where you're going to become stagnant versus that that who which can really look back um, at their failures, look back at the past, and be like, "Huh, I am so grateful for those moments." You don't have to be grateful in the moment. It's Exa okay that's if you're not. That's super human. Hard. Exactly. That's human, exactly. right? But to but look back and be grateful for those moments of failure, for those moments of pain, um, for those moments of sincere vulnerability, and look back and just be in deep gratitude and humility for them. That's when you know you've made a serious mindset shift and a serious self awareness shift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that was another misconception that I had. I huh. thought that if I'm this strong human being, I have to be uh, like be grateful for the failure, even mm -hmm. while I'm experiencing it. And I was like, yeah, I cannot do this, and I kept on forcing <laughs> myself to do that even though every everything around me told me that it's not possible or it's not or i not that it's not possible i don't have to do that in order to prove anything right so yep. the moment i started to be grateful for for the tough times looking mm -hmm. back after i've overcome them mm -hmm. is something something different happened definitely and it takes training right it's that mental yeah. health and hygiene doing it on a daily I basis love that. <laughs> yeah, rewiring on a daily basis. Um, we think, you know, my a really a very close person to me said, um, "How do you build a skyscraper?" 
And I said, well, how do you build it? He goes, you tell me. And I said, well, you know, you, you dig a hole really deep at you for the foundation of the skyscraper and then you build up, right? And he, and he said to me, okay, he goes, what you've done, you know, we were talking about my mindset and how I was still really, there's this specific blocks that I was having a really hard time getting rid of. And he said, here's what you've done. You have eliminated the skyscraper. Amazing. He goes, but here's what you haven't done. You haven't dug down and removed the foundation. Mm-hmm. So you've removed the skyscraper. So you think it's gone. It's done. No, what you haven't done is you haven't done even harder work, which is pulling up the roots, pulling up all that old foundation, because that's what makes the 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 skyscraper so strong and sturdy. Um, and so that's what we really have to do is when we are rewiring our brain, we have to remember how deep is the foundation of it. If we've we've eliminated the skyscraper, what we can see, but what haven't we eliminated? The stuff that we cannot see. And that's where the real work comes in. True. And some of the roots are like 20, 30, 40 years old. Years old yes, so. absolutely. I'm grateful that in some way, I'm grateful that I started working on myself when I was just about 22. Yeah. So I didn't end up at 50 or 60 and realizing that kind of like my whole life was a, was a lie. But yeah. <laughs> it's, still, it's still hard a lot of the times to, to change, sure. some, change some patterns. Uh, since we talked about, uh, about Brene Brown, mm-hmm. I want to ask you, because she defines courage as being able to speak your heart's truth. Mm. Uh, what makes you a courageous person? What makes me a courageous person? What, in, in general. What in makes general. One, what makes one a, a, a courageous person? Um, I really, today I really believe that to be courageous is to be vulnerable. And to be vulnerable is to be courageous. They're mutual constituents of one another. And what I mean by that is to be vulnerable means to show up and to speak truth um, in spaces where we are often told not to speak the truth. Mm -hmm. Vulnerability means showing up and saying, here are my mistakes, um, but, you know, and, and here's my ego, here's where I tripped up, um, and really talking about it openly alongside your successes. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I think vulnerability is also showing gratitude. Um, I think a lot of times people dismiss sort of an overabundance of gratitude or, or someone once told me, you know what, you're too humble. And I said, there's no such thing because when I am humble, my ego is not there to linger. And I really, really believe that. I really be, I really believe that when you are, when we're having these conversations, this is vulnerability. This is courage, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, Mm -hmm. you're, it's, you know, waking up and doing the thing day in and day out, despite some days not wanting to, some days really having an epic meltdown a crisis right and then showing up the next day and being grateful for the next day that is vulnerability that is courage i love that that's true how would you say what's the difference between i mean that's kind of it but the difference between courage and foolishness because some Mm. people see courage as being able to jump off a cliff if your friends are, are telling you, that's how your friends are telling you you're, you are courageous. But it's not, I don't feel like that's entirely entirely true. Mm-hmm. No, and, and I, I, I would agree with you. I think the difference between courage and foolishness is foolishness is absolutely rooted in your ego. Mm-hmm. Foolishness comes from a place of proving and also a place of defensiveness the way that Deepak Chopra talks about being defensive right feeling the need to prove something to say something to continuously do something to fill spaces that are not feeling fulfilled but the reality of it is when we act in in, when we act from a place of ego that's when the foolishness comes in more often than not Mm -hmm. whereas courage comes from a place of um, 
you know, it does come from a place of humility and it comes from a little bit of a place of uncertainty. Um, but we're willing to do it because I think foolishness doesn't give permission. Courage gives permission to others. Foolishness says, ah, not going to do that shit. Cour- <laughs> Cour- being courageous sort of gives people permission to say, wow, okay, oh, well, yeah, see this kid Mihai doing this stuff. Okay, May- maybe I can too. He He's stepping up to the plate. Maybe I can do the same. Courage shows up in that way. Courage shows up to give people permission. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Love that. Also, you're all about redefining what it means to have a revolution mm-hmm. through your company. Yeah. How do you define a revolution? So um, I've thought about this question for a long time because uh, as, as a woman of color and as an Arab woman, I grew up. We, I was grew up in a time of um, really seriously violent revolution happening all around us. Although um, distant, my connection to them was very real, and I. But that was all I was associated with. Right. Mm-hmm. That was all I felt like I could associate revolution with. Even though all around me really incredible, beautiful revolutions were happening on a daily basis, all around me, all the time, right? Um, every time someone helps someone at the grocery store, it's a tiny little blossom of a revolution of kindness. Um, when we are collaborating with one another rather than competing with one another, even if it's on a simple basis, right? Um, that is a form of a beautiful revolution blossoming. Um, the, the the fact that incredible amounts of entrepreneurs have come forth in a time of a recession here just in the United States and maybe it reverberated around the world. Those are the revolutions that I was experiencing. It wasn't just these violent revolutions that people were talking about continuously, right? It, we were imbibing in so much negativity and violence. And I thought, no, these are not the only. In fact, there were revolutions happening, incredible ones, beautiful ones long before these violent ones were happening. There were there were beautiful ones blossoming amidst the rubble. Amidst the rubble, there were beautiful revolutions happening, right? Women and men coming together to create ways of communication when communication was cut off during these revolutions, right? Mm-hmm. Where where they were told not to communicate with one another. There was there was severe punishment for communicating on Twitter, on social media, right? That's, those are incredible revolutions that were happening and that are still happening now. Um, and women are specifically, I speak to women who are doing it on a daily basis in their careers, um, in their companies, um, in their communities, and even behind closed doors. Revolutions happen when no one's watching. And those are the two, the true revolutionaries. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones that are going to do their work. They're going to be courageous. They're going to be vulnerable regardless of whether or not you and I are watching that. And those are the revolutions that I am concerned with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That in a good way. So a revolution doesn't have to be like this super big thing in order to be called a revolution. No. It can be, as you said, someone helping <clears throat> another person at the, at the grocery store. Yes. Cool. I love that. That makes it more approachable. Because yeah. when you think about it, I mean... It, a revolution is only when you can involve one million people. Right. We right. can think like, who am I to be able to engage that many, that many people? But yeah. if you can tell me that a revolution is also when I help someone at the grocery store, yeah. I kind of feel like I am, I count. Yeah. I count Absolutely. and I, my deeds count in making this world uh, a better place so that's super super powerful that's, and that's how it starts the the people who are doing the the real work the good work the work that takes courage the work that gives permission to others they know more than anybody else that it's not supposed to be a grand ordeal it's supposed to be little things on a daily basis that over time compound in to the greater revolutions 
that we have today. Every great person, they started off doing something um, mm-hmm. and, and they spoke, right? They were continuously speaking truth in spaces that allowed it and in spaces that didn't allow it. They spoke truth to power. They, they were continuously um, not seeking a podium, but rather seeking communication and collaboration and dialogue um, whenever they could. Um, and they were, and above all, they listened. Mm-hmm, they listened mm-hmm. because revolutionaries, they are also the carriers of stories. They carry each other's stories and they honor each other's stories along the way. And they are really, really good listeners because they know when it's time to convey a story, to convey the truth, to deconstruct a myth. It's important. It's important that we do it right. Right? Not that we do, not just that we do the right thing, but that we do the right thing right, the right way. And that's, that's important. That's profound. True. Um, let's talk a bit about <clears throat> love. Okay. I believe in love. You believe in love. Yes. And I, I believe like love is everything. And we have more love in the world than hate. And I saw that in one of your, uh, one of your Facebook pictures that you sa- shared recently. Yeah. And how can you, or how can we, mm-hmm. as leaders, use love to make a bigger impact in, in this world? I think that, well, I'll start here. I think there's no such thing as a great leader or a bad leader. As Simon Sinek says, you're either a leader or you're not. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. no no one's going to give you permission to be a leader. I know that, Mihai, you, you are a leader. You see yourself as a leader. I see myself as a leader. I don't need permission from you. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's always joyful and affirming to get permission and to see leaders around us doing great things. But you, you have to decide that first. Am I a leader or am I not? And that's okay. You may not be there yet, right? Mm-hmm. And then in addition to that, if you're going to be a leader, if you've decided that you are a leader, you better damn well also be a learner. Because if you're not a learner, if you're not a student, if you're not the best student in the room, then you're probably not ready for leadership. Okay? True. Because leaders are always learners first. Readers. I don't care what you tell me. I will never, that will always be um, true. Mm-hmm. Because, and, and think about it. Think about the greatest leaders that we that we, you know, that we follow, that we learn from, that are the greatest thought leaders, right? They're constantly learning. They're constantly learning. So that's where I would start first. Mm-hmm. How can we be better leaders is we have to redefine what it means to bring love into what we're doing. Um, I still, I mean, and, and I'm um, in the midst of a book that is really changing my life, a very, an old one, oddly enough, A Return to Love, Marianne Williamson. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a profoundly, um, I think, important book. That's, I think that's another book that I would say every single person has to read. Mindset and a Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Mm-hmm. 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 She, she talks about really, I think that we haven't really redefined love so that we can incorporate it in every space. I think that we still really identify love at a very superficial level. And that's why um, leaders and leadership and companies and entrepreneurs, corporations, spaces in general are, are not using it because we haven't redefined it. We haven't shifted out of an old paradigm. There are, there are people, like, right, like you and I, the, um, younger generations um, and maybe even older generations that understand that we're still functioning in an old paradigm, but this new paradigm is emerging and is really competing for the space, the space to to really be heard. And so we have to redefine love. Love is still considered um, only for intimate spaces. Exactly. Only between two people. Only um, when we show it openly, it's a little bit of a weakness. A lot of a bit of a weakness, right? Especially for men. Exactly. Oh my God. Exactly. You know, I mean, that's where my empathy really comes through. Um, for men, it's, I mean, talk about, and then for women, it's just sort of a, a default, right? A default weakness. That's what, um, that's so what they do. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. We were born and bred 
to love, but again, only specifically, right? Maternally love, maternally um, love our children or romantically and intimately love our spouses. Right. But the reality of it is we have to redefine love to really incorporate what it is, which is energy. Love is energy, just as just as other emotions are energy. Right. Anger is an energy. Joy is an energy. Grief is an energy. Um, all of these are energy. Love is included in that. So when leaders coming into their own leadership, maybe leading a company, maybe just leading themselves. Maybe they're an entrepreneur leaving their company. Redefine what love means to you. And if it is constrained in any way, begin to undo those chains on your definition of love. See it as a form of energy. And one energy that love takes on, um, Mihai, is compassion. And that's where, where I teach um, my thought leader, my powerful female thought leaders, um, CFOs, CEOs that I've worked with, I say to them, untether love from what it what it should be into all that it really can be and the first place that we start is with compassion um you know i i I like to i like to think that my strength one of my greatest strengths in the work that i do is that i can always use compassion as starting base no matter how messed up the situation is no matter how angry that person has made me no matter how you know how many mistakes or failures have been made in that moment i can always come back to a place of compassion and start from there that's a form of love it that's is. a form of love in leadership and so i think that that's where we really need to start as leaders is what is our definition of love and are we using it to its full capacity um right now i know that we're not True, I love this because we need to start to see love more as compassion and not as just a, a romantic a romantic thing. Right. True. <clears throat> and if as leaders, if we don't react from a if we don't act from a place of compassion, we kinda react. We cannot respond. Absolutely. Respond. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. This was okay. this was truly amazing. And thank you again for, for accepting my invitation.